Okay. So, uh, what we saw in the last lecture is the Propoff criterion and uh, let me sort of uh, re, um, restate what the Propoff criterion is. So, um, so uh, again we are uh, looking at, uh, uh, at a situation where you have a non-linearity and a linear plant and they are interconnected in the following way and we want to talk about the asymptotic stability of this uh, this system and uh, there are these uh, conditions first of all the nonlinearity is uh, locally lipschitz memoryless So, uh, locally Lipschitz has something to do with the continuity of this uh, this function. Uh, memoryless, we have already seen that it doesn't depend upon the uh, on the past. Uh, so, memoryless. So, so the nonlinearity is all that, and uh, the nonlinearity, of course, also lies in the zero k sector. Okay. Then, uh, in order to uh, talk about the asymptotic stability of all this. What, uh, what we did was we constructed an equivalent uh, um, feedback structure where what we did was to the nonlinearity we put 1 up 1 plus a s in, uh, in series and uh, we fed back 1 by k. Okay, and we had the plant G S. So in series to that, we had one plus A S, and uh, this was fed back, negative feedback, and here again the same gain one by K is put forward here, and fed forward, positive sign came through. So, we did this modification for the nonlinearity in the following way and uh, so we do the modification for the uh, linear part in that following way and then from that uh, we have uh, we showed that this new nonlinearity is still going to be passive that means in terms of this this input here I call it sigma 1. So, this whole thing is the new nonlinearity. Okay, and the psi is the output of the nonlinearity, sigma 1 is the input, then this nonlinearity is passive with respect to the input uh, sigma 1 and the output psi. And then that linear uh, plant, uh, we, uh, if we can show that that is also uh, passive, then the resulting system is passive and uh, therefore this uh, asymptotic stab asymptotically stable and therefore that is asymptotically stable. So, the resulting linear plant that you have here is 1 plus a s times g s plus 1 by k okay. and this must be this must be positive real if uh, if the if the if the interconnection is going to be uh, passive if that is going to be passive then this must be positive real and therefore uh, this must be positive real and this is the Popov criterion. Okay. Of course, this being positive real is like saying the real part of the trans function 1 plus a s times g s plus 1 by k must be greater than or equal to 0 that's the that's the, that's the popov criterion okay now uh, how does one check the popov criterion well uh, one can check the popov criterion uh, so uh, of course some other things need to be talked about you see if this 1 plus as times gs this guy is uh, plus 1 by k this is going to be positive real then 1 plus as times gs this this transfer function Okay, so so let's just look at the transfer function G S and make some comments about the transfer function G S. You see, uh, given a transfer function P S 
transfers by qs. Uh, if you say that this transfer function is positive real, then what we are saying is that the Nyquist plot of this transfer function is going to p of j omega by q of j omega. So, the Nyquist plot is going to lie in the first and the second quadrant. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, the first and the fourth quadrant. Okay, that means its a real part is going to be positive. But if it had to be positive, then we can say something about the degree of p and q. We can say that the degree of p, p of s, minus the degree of q of s. That means the difference in degree. This, the modulus value, uh, can at most be one. So, the relative degree can be at most 1. Now, when you are looking at transfer functions, uh, typically you are looking at proper uh, proper transfer functions. That means, the denominator polynomial has a degree which is greater than or equal to uh, that of the numerator polynomial. So, uh, the two situations that you could have uh, then for positive real functions is the degree of P s is equal to degree of Q s or degree of P s plus 1 is equal to degree of q s. So, so, in addition if you put the properness condition ok. Now, the Popov criterion says that given a transfer function g of s 1 plus a s times g of s plus 1 by k is positive real. Now, if this whole transfer function had to be positive real, that means uh, the degree of the numerator divided by the degree of the denominator must be having, uh, uh, having a difference, uh, they must have equal degree or uh, uh, the numerator must be 1 degree smaller than the denominator. Now, uh, this 1 by k portion is something that we can forget because uh, this being positive 1 by k being positive you can take it off and so you can claim that 1 plus a s times g s should be positive real or shifted positive real that kind of thing. And therefore, we can conclude that g of s for this to be positive real, this whole thing to g of s must be strictly proper. So, g of s must be strictly pop proper because you are now multiplying the numerator by one more degree in s and the resulting thing continues to be proper. Therefore, g of s must be strictly proper. So, uh, going back to the Popov criterion, uh, you always have this g of s interconnected to the nonlinearity. The nonlinearity is in the 0 k sector, and this g of s has to be strictly proper. Okay. Now, uh, how does one check whether this condition is satisfied. Well, uh, the best way to check whether that condition is satisfied is by uh, uh, by evaluation. So, uh, let us assume let us assume that you have this uh, transfer function g of s uh, which is let us say p s by q s. Okay, uh, we need to we need not bother about that. We want to check that one plus a s times g s plus one by k. The real part of this whole thing is greater than or equal to zero. 
Okay. Uh, so, the real part uh, when uh, when you substitute S equal to j omega. So, that is like saying 1 plus j a omega times the real part of g j omega plus j times the imaginary part of g j omega plus 1 by k must be greater than or equal to 0. It is the real part of this thing. Okay, so, one could uh, evaluate the real part of this. So, the real part of this is going to be the real part of g j omega. Yeah. Okay. So, the real part of g j omega. Then, this product is going to be imaginary. Then, uh, you have uh, this, this product here that uh, that gives you minus a omega times the imaginary part of g j omega plus 1 by k is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, how does one uh, determine whether for a given transfer function g, this condition is satisfied. So, we do the following. We do the following. So, we make the following plot. On the x axis, you plot the real part of g j omega. And on the y axis, you plot omega times the imaginary part of g j omega. So, so at any omega, you evaluate the real part of g j omega and it has some value, let us say something and the omega times the imaginary part of g j omega, it has some value. So, these two will give you some point there. Now, for each omega, you evaluate these points and you plot this thing. Okay. Such a plot is called the Popov plot. Now, uh, what we need to check on the Popov plot is that uh, the real part of g j omega minus a omega times the imaginary part of g j omega plus 1 by k is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Uh, but this now with the axis this showing the real part of g j omega and this axis showing the imaginary part of g j omega. This is essentially the equation of uh, uh, I mean uh, if you if I think of this axis as y and this axis as x then the what we are saying is x minus a times y plus 1 by k is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, of course, uh, if, if you look at the equality, you get this uh, equation which is um, which is x minus a y plus 1 by k equal to 0. Okay. So, this okay. So, this is the equation of what line? This line is going to pass through the point minus 1 by k and it is going to have a positive slope and the slope of. So, you have a line like that and uh, the slope of this line is 1 by a. Now, x minus a y plus 1 by k greater than or equal to 0 is essentially this portion of the plot. Okay. So, uh, so, in order to check whether a given transfer function is, um, is going to satisfy the Popov criterion, what you have to really draw is the Popov plot, where on the x axis you have the real part of g j omega, on the y axis you have the omega times imaginary part of g j omega. For example, the Nyquist plot, you would be plotting real part of g j omega and imaginary part of without the omega. So, you get the Nyquist plot, but this is not the Nyquist plot, but the Popov plot. So, you on the x, you have real part of g j omega, on the y, you have omega times the imaginary part of g j omega, you get the Popov plot. 
and uh, because you wanted to check 1 plus a s times g s plus 1 by k is positive real. Uh, this is what you wanted to check. So, this 1 by k, so minus 1 by k you take as an intercept of a line with slope 1 by a okay? and then the Popov plot that you have plotted must be such that it should lie to the right of it. That means, uh, if it lies to the right of it of course, it satisfies this, uh, this particular inequality and therefore, this transfer function is going to be positive real. Okay. So, the way you check whether something is positive real or not is by drawing the Popov plot and you have the line and then you check whether it is uh, positive, uh, I mean it is lying on the appropriate half space. Okay, so, we have now seen how one uses this uh, Popov criterion through the Popov plot you can uh, get the um, uh, get the idea whether the, uh, the resulting system is uh, actually asymptotically stable or not. Now, um, initially when a lot of these results were arrived at, at in those days itself for the proofs uh, linear matrix inequalities had made an appearance, but uh, at, at that point in time uh, maybe because uh, the computational uh, power was not that high, uh, these, uh, these linear matrix inequalities stayed restricted to, um, to, the, um, to the theory in the sense that uh, they used these linear matrix inequalities in the proofs of theorems and so on, but was not practically used because it was uh, considered not very efficient. But nowadays of course, there is a lot more computing power and uh, linear matrix inequalities have uh, come uh, in a big way. Uh, so, now uh, people do use the linear matrix inequality. So, what I will do right now is I would uh, show how a lot of these results like the circle criterion and Popov criterion and so on um, do come up. Uh, in the context of linear matrix inequalities and uh, what is the relationship between them. Of course, uh, this whole thing centers around a very central theorem uh, which was proved by Yakubovich uh, sometime in the early 60s. So, uh, let me now uh, uh, motivate how this comes about. Yeah. So, uh, what we will do is we will assume that we given the state space equations of a linear system. So, you have x dot equal to a x plus uh, b, b u let us say okay. and uh, y equal to c x plus uh, d u. All right. Now, this is the linear part. So, you have the linear part. So, the linear part and you have the input, you have the output. Now, you are going to connect a nonlinearity to this thing. Yeah, how we connect it is right now not very important, but we are going to connect a nonlinearity to this linear part. But ultimately, what one wants to do is find a storage function for the net system. Okay. So, let us make the assumption that the storage function or the Lyapunov function is dependent upon the states of the linear part and uh, let us say it is something like x transpose p x. Of course, if this had to be a Lyapunov function, this p had to be positive definite. But, uh, so the question uh, is whether one can find a positive definite p such that x transpose p x this is positive and if we think of this as v of x and you evaluate v dot of x, then this v dot of x must be negative. Yeah. And uh, if that is true and this is true, the, that means P is a positive definite matrix and uh, its derivative is negative over the trajectories, then what you really have is, um, is an asymptotic, um, uh, I mean you can conclude asymptotic stability. 
But if you evaluate this v dot x, I mean uh, in this particular case, uh, one could uh, write this v dot x as uh, something like uh, 2 x transpose p times a x plus b u. Yeah, I mean, uh, so of course, there is something here, something there, but I have just put them all together. So, this is the expression that you get for v dot and it is in terms of the states of the linear system and the input u. Okay. And so, what you want to really do or what you want to really find is in this x u space, so the space of states and inputs, you want this expression to be negative for all values of x and u. This expression must be negative and for all values of x uh, and uh, the p matrix that you have must be positive definite. So, this, this expression must be negative and p must be positive definite. If you can do that, then you can say that the, that the net system is, uh, uh, is asymptotically stable. Okay. Of course, when I write such an expression down, I have uh, written this purely in terms of the linear part and so you might wonder how is the nonlinearity going to come in at all. But you see, when we write out the equations to uh, for this x and u, this x and u are not independent of each other, but they are related to each other. And how are they related to each other? Well, this u is a function I mean u is really coming from the nonlinearity and uh, this nonlinearity uses the y as the input and so this u is actually dependent on y which in turn of course is dependent on x and so um, so 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 really this x and u are not completely independent but they are dependent and somehow that dependence has to come in so now uh, the suggestion that had come about is that instead of asking for this v dot x which is this expression to be less than 0, Lure suggested that you should uh, okay, Lure suggested that uh, instead of uh, okay, so showing that v dot is less than 0 is the same as showing minus v dot x is positive definite, but instead of showing minus v dot x is positive definite, Lure said that minus v dot x is positive definite minus some, some quadratic expression. So, let me call it q which depends on x and u. So, this this quadratic expression it depends on x and u and this quadratic expression is in some sense a relationship given by the nonlinearity and this resulting thing must be positive definite. Okay. So, what I am trying to say is that instead of asking the question for all x's and u's you must find a p which is positive definite such that for all x's and u's this expression is negative definite. But of course, this expression is dependent on x and u. So, it might not turn out to be negative definite yeah, and you might not get a positive definite p, but this x and u, you, when you just ask that question, you are thinking of x and u as being independent, but they are really not independent, but are dependent on each other through this nonlinearity. And so, instead of looking for this expression to be negative definite or the negative of this to be positive definite, what one does is one looks at that expression and some more expression and this expression depends on the nonlinearity and this net thing should be greater than 0. And uh, this is in fact what comes out in the uh, in the frequency theorem. Okay, so, maybe I would I would state the frequency theorem right away. Okay. So, what the frequency theorem states is the following. So, again consider state space equations A x plus uh, B u let us say and, uh, and let us say 
uh, that we have a nonlinearity. And the nonlinearity satisfies a quadratic uh, a quadratic um, expression like. Uh, q x u. So, the nonlinearity satisfies this uh, quadratic uh, expression like q x u is greater than equal to 0 for all x and u that appear on the uh, for the nonlinearity. Okay. And then uh, the necessary the necessary and sufficient conditions for existence of uh, such a p that we are looking for, for existence of p for which uh, that expression that we were talking about that is uh, the real part of x transpose p a x plus b u plus g times x u being less than equal to 0 for all x and u. This for the existence of such a p, the necessary and sufficient condition is that uh, uh, sorry, I am calling it g, I am calling it q. So, q x u is that uh, q of for x, I would use this equation and for x, I would write down j omega i minus a inverse b u u. This quadratic expression is less than equal to 0 for all u and if this is true, okay, so if this condition is satisfied, so this is, uh, this is also called the frequency theorem. theorem so, what the frequency theorem is saying that the necessary and sufficient condition for existence of uh, positive definite p, so the p which is positive definite for which the real part of all this is less than or equal to 0 for all x and u. Okay. And of course, here now we think of this x and u not as time signals, but as frequency signals. So, in the frequency space you could think of these things. Uh, and uh, then in that case, uh, this this thing is satisfied if uh, you just take the quadratic part and for the x you substitute j omega i minus a inverse b u, which is what you would get from the linear equation of the, the linear part and this expression must be less than or equal to 0 for all u. Yeah, this is called the frequency theorem and this theorem was in fact uh, proved by uh, Jakobovich. Okay. So, I, uh, I will not give a, a proof of this theorem, but uh, uh, we can straight away see that the necessity will always be there. Uh, I mean this, this condition that this thing is less than or equal to 0 for all u, this is a necessary condition and uh, one, one way to see that is uh, see if you if you're thinking about the linear part i mean uh, uh, the linear plant then uh, you know you can always write down j omega x equal to uh, ax plus b u of course here uh, let me just put hats because we are talking in terms of frequency in fact even in the even in the previous expression, I I could put just hats just to 
differentiate the fact that this uh, U and this X hat we are thinking of is really in the frequency domain. Okay, so so we have this. Okay, now uh, if you are going to look at uh, the uh, the expression. So, if you are going to look at the expression, the real part of x transpose p and then you have a x plus b u okay, plus q of x u and we want this to be less than equal to 0, but out here because a x hat plus b okay, sorry, all the hats are there. Okay, but because a x hat plus b u hat is equal to j omega x hat. So, this is the same as the real part of j omega x hat transpose p x hat plus q x hat u hat. Okay. But you see this expression here is a purely imaginary part. So, when you are looking at the real part this does not appear. So, it is just the real part of this and the real part of this and uh, for x hat now using that equation we can substitute and you get j omega minus a inverse b u hat that is equal to x hat just substitute that in here and whatever you have would be q of j omega minus i inverse minus a inverse b u hat u hat this must be less than equal to 0 for all u hat. So, you see the necessity of this uh, of the condition that we were talking about in the frequency theorem is uh, clear uh, immediately. Uh, that means, you just assume the linear part and just uh, take uh, take it in the frequency domain and just substitute in here. This expression will become a purely imaginary expression and so, you are just left with this expression and that is less than equal to 0. Yeah. Of course, uh, while stating this, uh, I mean uh, we wanted we wanted to find out this v dot is less than 0 and th this expression is really a time domain expression and we move from a time domain condition to a frequency domain condition and uh, the frequency domain condition essentially was that this expression that you get. So, as I told you earlier it was suggested that to try to find this to be strictly less than 0 is not possible because there is a relationship between x and u. So, you add an extra term which is x and u and so you want this whole term to be greater than 0 and uh, this you can just convert this into the frequency domain and the expression that you would end up with is this expression. Okay. And the condition necessary and sufficient condition for this to be true is that you just take the, the quadratic satisfied by the nonlinearity and for the x hat you get the expression coming from the linear hat and substitute in that and this resulting thing must be less than equal to 0. Okay. Now, um, we, can, uh, we can see uh, immediately that uh, uh, this particular uh, frequency theorem uh, in some sense gives us all that we saw uh, using the circle criterion and loop transformations and so on. Okay. So, um, so here, is, uh, uh, he, here is an example of this, uh, of this, this, uh, this particular result. So, suppose we look at the linear plant x dot equal to a x plus b u y equal to c x plus d u let us say. Okay. Or uh, this is of course, the state space uh, the state space equations. Uh, one could also write the frequency domain equations and uh, you could just say g j omega u g j omega u hat is equal to y hat. Okay. And so, uh, think of this as the linear part and you have u hat here 
you have y hat here okay and now suppose you are going to attach a non-linearity and uh, something like this but uh, let us not to be bothered about whether it is uh, negative feedback or anything like that. If you are going to have an interconnection like this then what you will have here is y hat and what you will have here is u hat. If it was a negative feedback of course, you would have had minus u hat here. Okay. Now, this nonlinearity, let us assume this nonlinearity is a passive nonlinearity, that means it belongs to the 0 infinity sector. Okay. What that means is it is either in this quadrant or this quadrant, so it is like some something like that. And here, what you have this is the input output diagram of the nonlinearity. So, the input of the nonlinearity is really y hat. And the output of the nonlinearity is going to be u hat or uh, or minus u hat, depending upon how you want to see it. Yeah, whether it's a negative feedback or not. Okay, so just uh, to avoid any complications, let me just uh, uh, assume that uh, this is in fact minus u hat, so that you have a negative feedback and so on. Okay. So, if I call that u hat, I will have to call this minus u hat. So, you have minus u hat there. Okay. Now, a quadratic expression which is satisfied by such a nonlinearity, one quadratic expression, uh, okay, le let me call this minus u hat psi. Then, uh, the quadratic expression satisfied by this thing this nonlinearity is input multiplied by output must be greater than 0, because that is precisely what happens in this quadrant and this quadrant. Okay, which means I could write that down as y hat psi is greater than y hat psi is um, greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So, this y hat psi is really it plays the role of q x xi that we are talking about in the frequency theorem. So, in the frequency theorem we said there is a non-linearity satisfies a quadratic expression like that. So, that quadratic expression is here. Then uh, further the frequency uh, condition said that the necessary and sufficient condition for existence of this p is that the real part of this must for which the real part of this is uh, less than equal to 0. Yeah. Thus, simply you just take q that means, whatever is the transfer function that comes from the linear part and that must be less than or equal to 0. Okay. So, if you if we look at this expression, yeah, this is a quadratic expression and in this quadratic expression this y hat is something that comes from here. So, for y hat I could just write down g j omega u hat. So, what I will have here is uh, g j omega u hat and the psi is really minus u hat. So, it is u hat squared. So, g j omega u hat squared and this expression that we are talking about is q this this and this expression is essentially g j omega u hat with a minus sign because the psi is really minus u hat. So, this is what you get and the frequency theorem says that this must be less than or equal to 0. Now, uh, this being less than or equal to 0, well this u hat squared is anyway positive is the same as saying g j omega must be greater than or equal to 0 for all omega. Yeah. But of course, g j omega of course, is a complex expression. So, what we are really looking for is that the real part of this must be greater than or equal to 0. But the real part of this being greater than or equal to 0 is in fact, our definition for positive real. Yeah. And we do know that if you put a positive real function along with uh, a non-linearity which has uh, uh, which is in the zero infinity sector, then that that was our basic theorem for uh, that was that was the basic passivity theorem. You see, 
yeah so you arrive at the same conditions that means you the linear plant will have to be positive positive real you arrive at the same conditions by just using uh, using this frequency um, theorem so uh, just to reiterate the frequency theorem it says that if you have this uh, you, in order to want this uh, have this expression to be less than or equal to 0 it is enough to substitute for the x i mean whatever is the quadratic expression satisfied by the nonlinearity for that for the x part you substitute from the linear equation and you had and the resulting quadratic must be less than or equal to 0 yeah actually perhaps you have to say the real part of that uh, because after all this expression would be a complex expression and uh, less than equal to 0 for a complex expression really does not make sense. So, the real part of it must be less than equal to 0. Okay. Now, uh, we can we, we could also look at uh, other cases and uh, you would immediately see that all the results that we had obtained by loop transformation and so on, they uh, they just fall out from the frequency theorem. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, let's now of course use uh, the same uh, linear part, but the nonlinearity let us assume is in the uh, zero uh, k sector. Yeah. Now, if it is in the zero k sector, so what that means is here is a line with slope k. And so uh, the nonlinearity lies in there. Okay. Now, if the nonlinearity lies in there, then uh, if you think of okay, so so let me call the input of the nonlinearity sigma, and um, the output let me call it phi. Okay. Then uh, clearly, this expression this expression k sigma minus phi, this expression k sigma minus phi. So, for this particular sigma what you will have is this length here which is positive. Okay. So, if this multiplies phi, so phi is positive and k sigma minus phi is positive. If sigma is negative, if sigma was negative, then what you would have is phi would also be negative, the output will also be negative and this here k sigma minus phi, this quantity here would also be negative. So, this expression is going to be greater than or equal to 0 for all nonlinearities that lie in this sector and so this will, uh, okay, so I could rewrite this as sigma minus phi by k times phi and this is going to be the quadratic that that is satisfied by the nonlinearity so so i could say that this is um, q of x hat u hat this is the quadratic q x hat u hat so now if we are thinking of the linear part and here is the nonlinearity with the input to the nonlinearity being sigma and the output being phi and you connect this up with a negative feedback. So, you have minus phi here and you have sigma as the output, then uh, using the fact that sigma hat is going to be equal to g j omega times phi hat with a negative sign. Now, if this is now substituted in there, then we would have effectively done the uh, done the substitution asked by the uh, frequency uh, theorem. So, if you do that, what you end up with is uh, minus g j omega minus one by k times phi hat squared this should be less than or equal to 0, but this is the same as saying g j omega must be greater than or equal to 1 by k and this is in fact the result 
of course, the real part because this. So, this translates to the real part of this being greater than or equal to minus 1 by k and this in fact is what we earlier saw that the. So, here is minus 1 by k and you have this line and the Nyquist plot of g j omega should lie to the right of it. So, we get that straight away by using this quadratic and uh, using the frequency theorem. Yeah. So, similarly of course, uh, when you have uh, uh, you know the circle the circle criterion will also come straight away from the frequency uh, theorem. In the circle criterion for example, we are looking at nonlinearity, which lies uh, in between these two slopes. So, let us say this is k 1 and this is k 2 and we are interested in the nonlinearity uh, lying between the sectors k 1 and k 2. Okay. So, the one way you can give a quadratic expression for such a nonlinearity is uh, is the following. So, it is k 2. So, if the input of the nonlinearity is called sigma and the output is called phi, then uh, then we have k 2 sigma minus phi. So, k 2 sigma minus phi this quantity here when sigma is uh, positive or this quantity here when sigma is negative okay. and uh, then this multiplying phi minus k 1 sigma. So, phi minus k 1 sigma is this quantity here. So, when sigma is positive both these quantities are positive and so their product is positive and sigma is negative both these quantities are negative and so their product is positive. So, this is the quadratic that is going to be satisfied by all the nonlinearities. And uh, if this is satisfied by all the nonlinearities, then uh, uh, taking the frequency domain, uh, I mean, after all, the interconnection was this is the linear part, and you have the nonlinear part, and this is the input of the nonlinearity, this is the output of the nonlinearity, and you are connecting this up with negative feedback. So, that is minus phi hat and sigma hat. So, just substituting this is minus g j omega times phi hat. If we substitute that into this expression, what we end up with is uh, k 2 minus k 2 times g j omega minus 1 this and you can pull the phi out and then the other expression that you have is uh, 1 plus k 1 g j omega. This whole thing the real part of this must be greater than equal uh, must be this must be sorry less than equal to 0, but then these negative signs you pull out and you will get k 2 g j omega plus 1 times 1 plus k 1 g j omega. The real part of this must be greater than equal to 0, but earlier from the circle criterion what we got is 1 plus k 2 g upon 1 plus k 1 g. This must be positive real, but that of course, translates to this. Yeah. So, as you see this frequency uh, theorem is a very, uh, very powerful theorem and uh, all these results that uh, we talked about using circle criterion, Popov criterion and so on, all of them will fall uh, straight into this, uh, uh, this category by using this frequency theorem. Yeah. And uh, of course, um, the way the way uh, Yakovovich arrived at the frequency theorem is because of several developments by other people like Lure who suggested this other uh, modification and what exactly one would seek to be negative definite and so on. Of course, there is a lot of other associated uh, literature which uh, I have not gone into. Like for example, uh, there is a case where uh, you could be attaching several nonlinearities to a linear plant. And it turns out that for each of these nonlinearities, you uh, have a quadratic expression of the nonlinearity. And uh, finally, uh, when you are going to check for v dot being uh, less than or equal to uh, 0, 
where v is the Lyapunov function kind of thing. So, what you do is each of these quadratic which is satisfied uh, by the various nonlinearity. So, each of those quadratics you add and this net expression you want to be less than equal to 0. Now, uh, this this is what is called the S procedure and um, yeah, so th there is a lot of such associated literature which uh, I am not going into. I mean uh, the set of lectures that I was planning to give uh, as far as this course is concerned is, uh, is sort of over and uh, the rest of the course uh, is handled by uh, Professor Madhu Belur. So, uh, that is all I have to say. Well, thank you very much.